Nigeria has recorded more cases of COVID-19, bringing the total number of confirmed infections to 20,244. A breakdown yesterday by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, showed that Lagos recorded 169 new cases, Oyo 52, Plateau 32, Imo 29, Kaduna 28, Ogun 23, the Federal Capital Territory, and Enugu 18, each, Bochi 17, Baosa 14, Rivers 8, Oshun and Kanu 6 each, Edo and Benue 5 each, Adamawa 3, Borno 2, and Abia Ekiti 1 each. This brings the total figures recorded to 20,244 confirmed cases, 6,879 persons discharged with 518 deaths recorded. And joining us live to take a look at this is Professor of Community Medicine, Chima Onoka. Uh, he's also the Executive Secretary for Christian Medical and Dental Association of Nigeria based in Abuja. Now, good morning, Professor. Morning. I'm uh, thank Thanks you for, for having me. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you. Now, the numbers keep climbing, and last week we had as many as 745 cases in just one day recorded. Is community spread now established in Nigeria? Um, thank you very much. I think we will say yes, it is established, and it has been established for a long time, you know, way before now. I mean, which is simply that you have cases, you have people with the infection who you can't say how and from whom they got infected. So that is established in the country and in different states. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the implications of community spread? You know, for those who may be hearing about it for the first time or don't quite understand, could you shed more light on that? It means basically that the next person next to you, you don't know whether he is infected or not. You don't know who you can get it from. And um, where we also have gatherings, meetings, um, events, I mean, those become um, stronger points of for transmission. Um, and that means that we all need to be more cautious um, to slow the process. The critical thing is slowing the process um, while that is going on, I mean, there are new discoveries happening, there are better ways of control that are happening, and then who knows, maybe, you know, we'll still have a lot of people who don't have it even by the time um, vaccines come out. Mm -hmm. So for slowing the transmission depends on that responsibility of being cautious. Um, so that's the important thing to note. Now, but, what, but what role does transparency and data gathering have to play in the matter of grassroots engagement and controlling the spread? I think there are two aspects of it. I mean, from the um, perspective of the citizens and then the people who are managing the um, control as well. So when the when citizens are more transparent, data gathering becomes easier. Um, we know um, clearly that even the figures we have really don't reflect the people infected in the country. And there are many people who have things like um, basic malaria symptoms who um, are not reported and um, for lots of reasons. So as including, you know, people not being open. So when, when we are more open, it becomes easier to, to get the right numbers out there. And um, so data gathering becomes easier. Um, but so that depends a lot on human behavior and that's not an easy thing. Now, when um, the, those managing the control efforts are also more transparent, with um, information about all sorts of things, what will really happen? I mean, someone asked me the other day, he said, what if it's the you know, seventh day, 10th day that his result comes out um, and he's still at home? What will happen to him if he is asked to come over for treatment? Is he gonna spend four days or 14 days? Mm -hmm. Such information will be useful to encourage people to do things that they need to do. So it's both ways. Transparency on each of those sites makes um, data gathering easier. Um, yes, and that's key for improving our control efforts. All right. Uh, talking about uh, uh, communication and messaging, what do you say to those who feel the messaging around COVID-19 is confusing and so have resorted to, you know, leaving it all to God, if you like? What I'll 
I'll say to them is that one is not their fault. They should recognize and realize that all over the world, everybody is confused. Um, all we are doing is to walk out of that confusion. And it's happening because it's a new virus. Um, we are making progress, everyone, in terms of um, going beyond the level of confusion as more information comes out. So while that is happening, leaving it to God is the right thing to do. But that means to, you know, doing what God expects us to do as well, which is being cautious, that we need to be cautious. And um, while we believe God to do the one that we can't do, that's what leaving it in the hands of God actively means. It's taking personal responsibility for the things that are under our control and then allowing him to, allowing God to do his own part mm -hmm. and not, you know, being, um, this, you know, being in a state of despair and giving up and all that. I don't think that's what God will expect us to, us to do. All right, Dr. Chima, please still stay on the line and hold your thoughts because we have uh, joining us also Njide Ndili to take a look, to still, still on the conversation around data, to talk to us about uh, Lucy, a digital health uh, platform. Uh, Njide Ndili is also the country director from Assess Nigeria. Good morning, Njide. Good morning. Glad to be here with you. Thank you for joining us. Now, uh, let's t talk again more about Lucy. The other time you were here with us, we, we did had some conversation. Now, what role does Lucy have to play in terms of affecting community spread, which already has been established in Nigeria? Okay. First of all, Lucy, uh, as I mentioned the last time I was on your program, is a digital service. Right. And what it does, it, it first of all, assesses the risk of the user uh, to determine if they're low risk or high risk uh, for COVID. It also monitors underlying conditions. But more than that, what it does is monitors daily your symptoms. But of course, you, the user, have to help the, the application to monitor by putting in your symptoms. Any slight changes in your, in your symptoms is very crucial because what then happens is that we have medical responders who are monitoring the symptoms that are keyed in um, and then can flag that you're either uh, high risk or moving to the high risk zone and then dispatches, either calls you or dispatches um, a, a medical responder to, to either pick you up to get tested or for treatment. But most importantly, the app monitors your symptoms daily. So any slight change, even in the breathing, your temperature could be a red flag. So that's what it does to help individuals take control because of course uh, it's an app on your phone, is a digital service that connects you to medical responders. But most importantly, you are in control. So you have the responsibility to put in your symptoms mm -hmm. into the application. All right, Ndida, but help us clarify. You know, there are those who say that such an app is limited in its effectiveness by how much data is available to it. How do you respond to that? No, that's, you know, every app um, is, of course, limited in a sense. But this is very peculiar because we have medical responders who are monitoring the, uh, the symptoms that are being keyed in. Of course, the personal medical information that are in inputted into the application. So there's a difference here. It's not uh, just putting in your app and leaving it in the, in the, in the device. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this case, the difference is that somebody is monitoring. What we fail to realize is that, you know, there's also the uh, psychosocial uh, side of COVID. Uh, people are scared. They don't know who to talk to. People are, you know, they don't know what to do. And again, they are afraid to go to the hospital. So this is really an intervention to help people communicate, to share their fears, to talk to, to medical, medically trained responders mm -hmm. so that they're able to assist them uh, if necessary and evacuate them or direct them, triage them to the right place either to get tested for treatment so it's very different okay now let's talk about those who are asymptomatic you know uh, experts have told us that there are a lot of uh, people carrying this uh, virus this disease but unfortunately or fortunately i don't know uh, they are asymptomatic how does the app account for this 
So the, the difference with asymptomatic cases, first of all, you don't show any symptoms at all. So what the app does is monitors the, the symptoms you're putting on a daily basis. And it could be a really slight change in your temperature or your breathing rate or some of those, uh, uh, or pain in your back, or some of those symptoms that have been uh, outlined by NCDC. You as an individual, you know, walking around, you may not really pay attention to it. But the, the app, so long as you're measuring it, the app is able to track it and, and, and pick it up. So until, you know, uh, uh, you get to a point where you are, uh, um, you know, there's a red flag, then there's a trigger for uh, contact or evacuation and so on. But you have to remember that those who are symptomatic, at some point, some of them slowly become symptomatic. And the symptoms are usually quite light to start with, then, you know, progresses quite quickly. Mm. So this is uh, the, the benefit of the app, that it tracks the, your breathing rate, your heart rate, your, the pain, based on instructions, and the app actually tells you how to do it, uh, and, and very quickly flags if there is a change, the slightest change uh, um, that could categorize you as high risk or possibly having COVID, the app picks it up. Mm -hmm. And this is where artificial intelligence and algorithms come into play. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of taking advantage of su such an app like Lucy, what of privacy concerns? You know, does it require some personal details uh, that people may not be very, very comfortable to share uh, in order for them to register. Yes, uh, and again, we have to uh, note that this is really a medical service. So there are data protection uh, requirements that have been met by this application. It meets the ISO uh, data protection, it meets uh, NITDA protection, it also meets the European uh, data protection standards. So it's quite uh, uh, protective of the individual's data because we know it's medical data and it's only accessed by the medical responders. No other person can access this data. Mm -hmm. And at the time you're signing up to use the app, you actually have to uh, consent uh, that your information is going to be analyzed by medical doctors. And it doesn't go beyond that. So uh, uh, in, in terms of the law, it you know, meets all the regulatory requirements for data protection. All right. Now, let, let's switch to uh, Professor Chima, who's still on the line. Professor Chima, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay. You've listened to this conversation between I and uh, Njide there. What do you make of such an app as Lucy? Um, I would say that... Um, we have a massive problem on our hands. The scope is wide. Um, it's not about 20,000 people. And then those two uh, are potential, who, who, you know, where we have potentials for infection is quite huge. I mean, we are speaking about more than 200 million people in Nigeria. So that's very significant. I, I think the work that Njide and our team are doing, um, that work is very critical because a big challenge in this situation is contact. Whatever can be done to reduce person-to-person -person contact is on the pathway, is, some, is a tool that is very useful in controlling this infection. And I think you know, that's where it really comes in. It reduces that person-to-person -person contact while not losing, um, you know, people not losing um, opportunities for care or to share their information in a protected way. The privacy issues are things that will develop. I mean, of course, it's not just that people, you know, there are guidelines for that and people have to sign up. But we know the usual challenge we have that uh, many people, I don't think it's only myself, we don't often read all the privacy statements before we sign up. Correct. Um, and so that's where um, being, um, they being Nigerian and her team, and supporting, you know, working from here as well will help, you know, take responsibility to see that Nigerians are protected while they use the app. But otherwise, it's a significant um, um, intervention or something to be added to this fight. And um, I'll clearly endorse it. All right. Professor Chima Onoka, Professor of Community Medicine, thank you for your thoughts uh, there this morning. And of course, Njide, uh, I believe you're still there.
Yes. All right. Uh, the work your team and yourself are doing are quite critical. In the words of Professor Onokade, we want to say thank you for joining us and do stay safe out there too. Thank you so much for having me.